This is 9.6, Ratio and Root Tests, Part 2. All right, so let's see where we are here. Example 4 is where we were when we left off last time. It's the one we were about to start. Um, this is interesting. Notice it starts at 2. There's probably a good reason for that. We shall see. In just a second, when I write the whole thing down, natural log of n, oh, I realize what it is right now, to the nth over n. Um, remember in the um, beginning part of this, I said that we want our terms to be non-zero. And the natural log of 1 is 0. And 0 to the first over 2 is 0, and that would be an, a 0 term. That's why I started this one at 2. Uh, otherwise, don't read anything into it. Now, I have something raised to the nth, which makes me think the ratio test is a good idea. Oh, sorry. The nth root test is a good idea. Uh-oh. I just realized on that last one um, in the last recording. I didn't get that. Could you try again? I'm, Sorry, my phone is thinking I'm saying Siri instead of series. Um, my apologies. Um, I, for, I think I forgot to write that it converges by the root test. So please go back in your notes and write that down, that that last example converged absolutely by the root test. And I told you I'd probably forget once, and that's bad because it cut, cuts across a recording which I ended. Oh well. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to forgive me that. Alright, so um, the root test, we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth root of uh, the absolute value of a sub n Now the natural log of n when n is 2 or bigger is positive. So a positive raised to a positive power is positive. Divide by 2 is positive. So the um, absolute value here is not needed. Um, if there were like a negative 1 raised to a power of n or something like that, it would strip that away as we saw another, in another example earlier. So, But anyway, the um, absolute value here is superfluous, so I get rid of it. But it does tell me, reminds me, that I'm doing an, a test for absolute convergence if it actually uh, does converge. Okay, so um, why in, oh my gosh, Whew, man, I, I need to just take a break. Um, I just realized something else I did. When I was copying this down, I wrote a 2 in that denominator. Uh, probably because I was thinking of the n equals 2 and I got myself distracted. That's not a 2. So let me go back and fix that. All right, so get my pen back to the right size and the right color, and there we go. So that should have been um, over n. And of course, n is always positive when n is 1 or bigger. So, again, that absolute value can be stripped away. It's superfluous. <laughs> so sorry. Okay. So, um, this is going to become the uh, nth root of the numerator divided by the nth root of the denominator. Do I say denominator twice? Whatever I said, uh, it's supposed to be the nth root of the numerator over the nth root of the denominator. Um, and that simplifies to be the natural log of n over the nth root of n. And um, I'd like for you to take your calculator for the for part of this, and I want you to think about what's going on here. Um, natural log of n is a function 
that we know looks like this. And so as n increases without bound, natural log of n increases without bound. So that numerator is going toward infinity. That one was actually one I expect you to know without a whole lot of discussion. So I'd like you to take your calculator and calculate the nth root of n. You may need to, in your calculator, type n to the 1 over n. And let's make n pretty big, like 50. 50 to the 1 over 50 is 1.08. Um, now I'm going to do 75 to the 1 over 75. That's 1.059. Now I'm going to do 250. I'm just making up numbers. To the 1 over 250. That's 1.02. Now 1,000. To the 1 over 1,000. 1 1.0069. So what's happening is as we take the nth root of n, as n gets bigger and bigger, those answers are, he answers are heading toward 1. That's a numerical thought process, um, and it's fine. So what we're getting is infinity over 1, which is infinity. It's the first time we've seen this. Um, infinity, we're not going to compare to 1, say greater than 1 here, uh, because getting infinity is a conclusion we can come to. So that limit being infinity means that this series diverges. So the series n equals 2 to infinity of the natural log of n to the nth over n diverges by the root test. Okay. Actually remember to say the root test this time. Pat myself on the back. Alrighty. So, uh, let's see what is next. The next thing that's introduced here is a kind of a conclusion of all the strategies that you might want to incorporate converges or diverges. So there's kind of a hierarchy on you, you need to try the easy things first and try the more complicated things as a last resort. So the very first thing you should always think about is the nth term test for divergence. Take the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n. If that's equal to anything that's not zero, that series diverges by the nth term test. If it equals zero, that's inconclusive. Keep trying. And a lot of times you can do that in your head. Uh, if you can tell that it's not going to go to zero, you write it out, say it diverges um, by the nth term test, or um, you know that it's zero and it's inconclusive and you don't even write that down. Two, um, is the series one of our special types, the ones that we've encountered that seem to be easy to deal with? Is it geometric? Is it a P-series? Is it a telescoping series? Is it an alternating series? Um, those are the things you'd want to think of first. Then, if it's not one of those, then think about, well, uh, how about the integral test? Is that a sub n can be something I can integrate? Does it meet the conditions for the integral test? Is the function that you'd rewrite f of x that, for that, is that a positive, continuous, and decreasing function from 1 to infinity? Okay. Then you might think, well, maybe the root test, if you have things raised to the power of n, a lot of those in there, you might use the root test. Or if the problem involves a lot of factorials and exponentials, you might use the ratio test. Then the last thing um, you would want to try is using uh, the comparison tests, either direct comparison or limit comparison. So in example five, um, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven examples uh, where I'm not telling you which uh, test to use. And so we're going to have to figure that out on each one of these. So let's start with uh, A. I guess I can write the A down. N plus 1 
over 3n plus 1. And using the first test, um, I'm going to write down what I'm thinking. Uh, if this ends up being inconclusive, then all this stuff I'm writing right now you would not have to write. Um, but just in case, I'm writing it down in case it is going to lead us to a conclusion. So in my head, I'm thinking, well, what is this limit of a sub n as n goes to infinity? And since this is one of those where you have the same power of n in the numerator and denominator, um, you can simply think of that as being the ratio of the leading coefficients, one third. That's obviously not zero. And so our conclusion is that this series, n equals 1 to infinity of n plus 1 over 3n plus 1, diverges by the nth term test. nth term test for divergence. Okay, B. Um, this is sigma. n equals 1 to infinity. Pi over 6 to the nth. Well, if I multiply something kind of close to 1 half by itself repeatedly, 1 half times times one half is one eighth, one sixteenth, one third second. That's going towards zero. So the nth term test will not tell me that this is going to diverge. So I'm going to have to use a different test. Um, you may realize that this is in the form of a geometric series. And you do get practice. Hopefully in the homework and quizzes you did for that section, you gained a lot of experience so you can start to see those more easily. Um, the directions do not say to find the sum if you can. That can be the directions. So for this one, if it converges, I'm going to find the sum uh, just to show you how you can do that. But that was actually not asked for in this question. Um, I'll make that clear. So um, R is um, pi over 6. And since the absolute value of R is between 0 and 1. This series converges. Okay. So um, the part that wasn't asked for was if it converges, what would its sum be? For the geometric series that converges, we actually have a formula, so we can actually find that sum. Most of the series, we cannot do that. Anyway, it's the first term, a. So if I put 1 in to pi over 6 to the nth, I'm going to get pi over 6. So the first term is pi over 6 divided by 1 minus r. Um, which is pi over 6 minus pi. I multiplied uh, both numerator and denominator by. And that's as simple as I'm going to go. So that's what that sum would be as an exact value. Again, that sum is not something that these directions said we had to find. So that was just extra. All right, the next one, C, sigma, n equals 1 to infinity, um, n e to the negative n squared. Uh, so uh, as n goes to infinity, uh, this will go to 0. So the nth term test won't give me um, anything and I do notice that the 
form there is going to lead me to an integral test because I'm, I'm kind of in the back of my mind thinking, can I integrate that? And so I think I can this one. So I'm going to let f of x equal x times e to the negative x squared. And um, then I can say f is positive because e to any power is a positive number. And x, of course, is positive, and the product of positives is positive. It is a continuous function. Um, you might want to think of this as x over e to the x squared. Um, e to the anything is never 0. Uh, you recall the graph of e to the x looks like this. So it's never equal to 0, so it's continuous for all real values. And um, I'm going to uh, say that we were told to use integral test on this one. Um, remember, what, what changes is if I tell you that it, to use integral test, you can assume that these three things are true, and you just need to make sure you write them down. Test. So I'm going to make that pretense. If uh, you had chosen to do this one and the directions didn't say use integral test, you'd have to prove that it's a decreasing function, which would be the first derivative test. And I'm not going to go through that here. We did it earlier in some examples. So um, I'm just going to pretend like I gave you the directions to use this. So uh, the integral test may be used because it passes all three of those. Uh, criteria and the other one that I mentioned earlier um, that I think I can integrate this that's obviously crucial so and right here I'm saying what test I'm using so I won't have to say it again at the end you know I'm sometimes bad about that I don't like when I forget to do that all right so we're going to set up an improper integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx. And of course the first part of an improper integral's solution is to rewrite that improper integral as the limit of a, a definite integral. So I'm going to go from 1 to b and then take the limit of that definite integral as b approaches infinity. All right. So um, I'm going to let u equal e to the negative x squared. No, I'm sorry. That's not going to work. My bad. I'm going to take that back. It's a little bit ambitious in writing that. It's um, u is going to be the exponent opposite of x squared. So du is negative 2x to the first. So I'm going to need the negative 2. I already have the x and the dx. So I need the negative 2. So I'm going to multiply inside by negative 2. And at the same time, multiply outside by negative 1 half, which gives me that negative 2. So again, off to the side, um, because I really don't want you in improper integrals to change the variable. Um, let's just think about what this would be. Um, we are e to the negative x squared, but that part of it is um, our e to the u. And everything that's underlined is my du. And so uh, the integral of e to the u, coolest function ever, is itself plus c. You may be able to do that in your head. That one was not extremely hard. But if you need to, you can always go off to the side and, and then come back with your answer in terms of x over here. So this is going to be negative 1 half times e to the u. Uh, we don't need the plus c because it's a definite integral. 
from 1 to b. So I'm going to substitute b in first. I'm also going to um, rewrite that expression in a simpler form as I do that. So that's negative 1 over 2e to the positive b squared. I remember I could take away that negative by putting that power e to the negative x squared and make that power positive and put it in the denominator. Minus negative 1 over 2e to the positive 1 squared. Okay. Now as b goes to infinity, um, the first fraction, because e to the b squared is in the denominator, that denominator increases without bound, and so constant divided by infinitely large heads towards zero. And in the second fraction, um, the limit of that constant is that constant. So this is 1 over 2e. So that's our answer. And since that's a real number, it's a real number um, that's positive. Um, happens to be positive, uh, then because it's a real number, the um, improper integral of 1 to infinity, roll that down so I can see what it was, um, x e to the negative x squared dx, since we got a real number answer, that tells us that that improper integral converges. Then we can say that since the improper integral converges, therefore we can say that the series that we started with also converges. So the conclusion here is two-step. You first proved that the improper integral converges, which means that the series converges. So you have to write both of those conclusions. Okay, D. Sigma n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over 3n plus 1. Well, as n goes to infinity, this term goes to 0, which is inconclusive. So I can't use the nth term test to say that it diverges. So um, I don't see that I could use. Yeah, there's several things. And keep in mind, there's usually <clears throat> more than one correct way to do something. So I'm, I'm going to take this off in a particular direction because it's what I'm seeing this first time. It doesn't mean it is the only way. It's just the way that I happen to see it. So um, remember those constants or anything with a lower power of n, um, like a, this plus 1, can be stripped away. Um, so if I do that, how does that compare to the original? Well, the left side is a bigger denominator, which means that it's a smaller fraction. And then if I were to take off that 3 coefficient, again, the denominator on the left is bigger, which means it's a smaller fraction. And that's about as simple as that gets. I'm going to call that b sub n. Um, let's see. So, oh, I just noticed something. I'll show you what I'm, what I'm thinking. Um, 
the B sub n series is the harmonic series. And it diverges, always. You don't have to reprove that to me. Well, the terms of our series are smaller than the terms of a divergent series, which is inconclusive. So I was trying to use direct comparison. Uh, that, that was my idea, but the inequality is going the wrong way. If a sub n had always been bigger than b sub n and b sub n diverged, then I could have said a sub n diverges, but that's not going to work. So if I've started the comparison test and the direct comparison doesn't work, this is a good time to, well, let's go ahead and do the uh, limit comparison and see if that's going to take us anywhere. Remember, the limit comparison is uh, limit uh, as n approaches infinity of a sub n over b sub n. Division of fractions gives me multiplication by the reciprocal of the denominator. And um, this is one of those simple ones um, that I think you ought to be able to do. It's so the same power numerator and denominator, so the leading coefficients ratio is 1 over 3. And then in the limit comparison test, this is where we say it has to be a positive finite number. And it is, so you tell me that you recognize that. And then we can draw the conclusion about this series, that this series, um, n equals 1, to infinity, 1 over 3 plus, not uh, 3n plus 1, converges, oh, actually it's also what am I saying? Excuse me. Um, I don't think that that says it converges, which is what I wrote down for myself. Um, that means that this actually diverges because whatever b sub n is doing, which we established up here, is it's divergent. Um, so because b sub n diverges and the limit comparison test gave us a positive and finite answer. That means that our a sub n does whatever our b sub n does. So I'll have to change my notes here um, because that means that it diverges also. So the, the series we're comparing it to is divergent and if we get a positive finite number when we do the um, limit of the ratio of those two, then uh, our series behaves the same way that the comparison series does. So um, this is also diverges by limit comparison. So, E. Oh, let me move this up a little bit. to infinity negative 1 
to the nth times 3 over 4n plus 1. The nth term of this does go to 0, so I won't be able to prove divergence that way if it's divergent. Let's see if it's convergent. Well, let's see. Think about this a second. <clears throat> um, I think it's really clear with that power of negative 1 in there that this one would be good to test using the alternating series test. So I'm going to make note of the fact that it will alternate and what my a sub n will be. That's the part of that expression without the power of negative 1 for the alternating series test, that is. <coughs> so test 1, the limit as n approaches infinity of 3 over 4n plus 1. goes to 0, constant divided by any power of n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Check. Uh, my a sub n plus 1. 3. <laughs> I say 3 in root 1. <coughs> Excuse me. 3 over 4 times n plus 1 plus 1 <coughs> excuse me which is 3 over 4n plus 5 and I want to compare that to a sub n and of course the denominator on the left is larger than the denominator on the right, which means that the fraction is less than, we can say or equal to, because that's the statement of the theorem that we had. And so a sub n plus 1 is always less than or equal to a sub n. Check. And therefore we can say that, uh, therefore we know that this series converges by the alternating series test. We can say that last phrase if we want. Um, but because we wrote alternates up above, I don't have to. So by the alternating series test is not absolutely necessary because of what we've already written. All right, F. This is the series from n equals 1 to infinity of n factorial. Oh, I see a factorial. Do you remember which one that is? You see a factorial? Yeah, that's right. We're going to use, <coughs> excuse me, for part E, we're going to use the Um, limit. I'm oh, sorry, the ratio test. Wow, that name just went right out of my head for a second. All right, so we take the limit as n approaches infinity of the a sub n plus 1. So that means we substitute n plus 1 in for every n. Divided by a sub n. So the absolute value of that whole fraction. Nothing in there can ever be anything but a positive number. <clears throat> so the absolute value has been considered and rejected as superfluous. So now I'm going to use the definition of division and rewrite this as the numerator multiplied by the reciprocal of the denominator. Okay. 
so n plus 1 factorial divided by n factorial leaves n plus 1 in the numerator and canceling 10 to the nth from both numerator and denominator we're left with 10 to the first in the uh, denominator <coughs> excuse me and as n goes to infinity that fraction goes to infinity so what does that imply do you remember implies that this series diverges. Don't forget the name of the test by the ratio test. Again, you may have thought of a different test for this one and run it successfully and found <coughs> divergence a different way. Um, this is just the first way I thought of. <clears throat> now, it's my caveat for all of these examples. There may be other ways, maybe even better ways than what I'm um, thinking of in each case. Okay, we've got a fraction that is a function of n that is raised to the nth power. And to me, this sort of screams uh, um, the nth root, nth root test. And so that something to the nth is a clear giveaway that that n power needs to be taken away so that we can investigate what's going on. So remember this is the nth root of the absolute value of your a sub n expression. And of course, um, n plus 1 and 2n plus 1 are both positive. So in this case, the absolute value is superfluous. We can just remove it. No problem. And that leaves us with the nth root of something to the nth, which simplifies to be that something, the base of that power. And this is one of those simple ones I told you before that I want you to know how to do um, greatest power of n is n to the first. That's the greatest power of both numerator and denominator. And so the limit is the ratio of the leading coefficients. For this test, <coughs> the nth root test, I'm sorry, the root test, um, what we're going to do with that one, that's definitely less than one. And what conclusion do we draw when it says less than? Correct, convergence. So to investigate, n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 raised to the nth power converges. By the root test. All right. Okie dokie. So that's those problems. Then on the next uh, page very last page of the notes are uh, the strategies for testing series is a very nice summary of all of the tests for series. So let's just take a look at those and uh, 
Pay attention to the name of the test, what the series will look like. I'm reading along the top. Um, what conditions are required for convergence? What conditions are required for divergence? And any comments that come out of that. So the nth term test can only be used to find divergence. It cannot confirm convergence at all. So if the limit of your nth term as n approaches infinity is anything but zero, it will diverge. Geometric series are not equal to zero. <clears throat> um, it's the way they put it. I had you putting um, the absolute value of r between zero and one. Um, they just said r can't be zero to begin with. I guess that's true too. You write that way. Anyway, that series is sigma of a times r to the nth. If the absolute value of r is between 0 and 1, you have convergence. If the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, you have divergence. And there is a formula for the sum of that series. The telescoping series, um, the limit as n approaches infinity of that b sub n formula needs to be a, a real number l for convergence. Notice it does not test for divergence. And if it converges, the sum can be found using that formula. P series is 1 over n to the p. Converges when p is greater than 1. Diverges when p is between 0 and 1, including 1. Alternating series um, looks like that. Negative 1 to the n minus 1 they have. It can be n, or n plus 1 is the exponent, times a sub n, where a sub n is a positive thing ignores the power of negative 1. And they wrote the tests backwards here. Um, first test always do is the limit of your a sub n as n approaches infinity must be 0. And a sub n plus 1 must be less than or equal to a sub n. And that determines convergence. Notice that there is no way to prove divergence for alternating series. And the note there is that the absolute value of the remaining part of the series when you take the first n terms to um, estimate the value of s is going to be less than or equal to the first neglected term. Let's see. Um, and notice we can't find the sum there. So the only two in that whole table we can find the sum would be the geometric series or the telescoping series. Best where F has to be continuous, positive, and decreasing. Um, the improper integral converges means the series converges. The improper integral diverging means the series diverges. And that remainder thing is something we didn't talk about. I kind of mentioned it a little bit, but I knew that we weren't going to, I was not going to hold you accountable for that. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, just ignore that that remark on the integral uh, test because we're, I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. Then there's the root test, as we just talked about. Uh, that limit, less than 1, greater than 1, or infinity, or equal to 1 are the possibilities. Less than 1 for convergence, greater than 1 or infinity for divergence, equals 1, the test is inconclusive. The ratio test, also finding the limit, same thing, less than 1 means convergent. Greater than 1 or infinity means divergent. Equals 1 is inconclusive. Direct comparison. Both a sub n and b sub n have to be positive. Um, the, um, if you find that the uh, one you're comparing to is convergent and your term is less than or equal to that, your a sub n is always less than or equal to b sub n, means that you will have convergence. Um, if your uh, b sub n diverges and your a sub n terms are always bigger than your b sub n terms, then that would mean that a sub n also diverges. Limit comparison, you find the limit of a sub n over b sub n. If you get a positive finite answer, um, then you can draw the conclusion that a sub n will do whatever b sub n does. If b sub n converges, 
a sub n will converge also. Um, if b sub n diverges, when you get that positive finite limit for the um, limit of a sub n over b sub n, if b sub n diverges, then that would mean that a sub n diverges also. So those are the tests that you need to make sure you know. Uh, testing for the convergence and sometimes divergence of a series and a few of the remarks, uh, except for the integral test, those remarks are all important. Make sure that you know all of those as well. Okay, that's the end of this section. Have a good day.